In this lecture, we'll look at data that naturally forms a sequence. For instance, language, music, or stock prices. Before we look at how to model sequences, let's first look at some basic things to take into account when interpreting such data. We'll start by looking at the different types of sequential data sets we might encounter. As with the traditional setting of a table of independently sampled instances, we can divide our features here into numeric and discrete. A single one-dimensional numeric sequence might look like this. This could be a stock price over time, traffic to a web server, or atmospheric pressure over Amsterdam. In this case, the data shows us the number of sunspots observed over time. Sequential numeric data can also be multidimensional. For instance, in this example, we see the closing index of the AEX and the FTSE 100 over time. At each point in time, we get a 2D vector, so this data is a sequence of two-dimensional vectors. If the elements of our data are discrete, analogous to a categorical feature, it becomes a sequence of symbols. Language is a prime example. In fact, we can model language as a sequence in two different ways, as a sequence of words or as a sequence of characters. Symbolic sequences can also be multidimensional. For instance, here we see a sequence of words where each word has been tagged with its part of speech, the grammatical category of the word in this context. We can think of this as a two-dimensional symbolic sequence. And even more complicated examples, such as music, are also possible. For something like music, it can be quite complicated to figure out how to represent all of the information in a piece of music into a single symbolic sequence. For now, we'll stick with the simple examples where the mapping from raw data to a sequence of symbols or a sequence of feature vectors is relatively straightforward. The next question we need to answer is what it is that we're trying to predict. One possibility is that we have a normal classification or regression task, but that the instances are not represented by feature vectors but by sequences. This slide shows a simple example, email classification. Each email is represented by a sequence of words or characters, and each such sequence carries one target label, ham or spam. Among the instances themselves, there is not any strong sequential ordering. Emails do have a timestamp, but this ordering is usually ignored. An entirely different setting is one where the dataset as a whole is a sequence, and the instances are the elements within the sequence. For instance, in our sunspot example, we may consider each point in our sequence as a single instance consisting of a single feature. In that case, we often want to predict the future values of the sequence based on what we've seen in the past. One simple way to achieve this is to translate it to a classic regression problem by representing each point by a fixed number of values before it. In this case, we look at each point in the sequence we look at the three values before it, and we use those as three features representing the point. This gives us a classical data set that looks like this. A simple table with columns for features and one extra column for the target label. And if we train a regression model on this data in the same way we've been doing since the first lecture, then we can use the resulting model at any point in time to predict the next value of the sequence based on the three preceding values. And we can extend this idea with many other features. For instance, the mean over the whole history so far, the mean over the last 10 points, the variance over the last 10 points, and so on. This is a great way to solve this kind of sequence prediction task without too much hassle. We simply translate it to a known abstract task rather than designing a whole new approach specific to the sequence setting. However, remember what we said in lecture three. When your data has a meaningful ordering in time, you should keep it ordered that way when you make your data splits. You don't want to train on data that is in the future compared to your test data. In production, you won't have that luxury. So to make your test setting a good simulation of production, you should keep your data ordered by time so that all of your training data precedes all of your test data. If you can realistically expect in production to retrain your model periodically, then you can simulate this by testing on a small batch of your test set, adding it to the training data, and retraining your model. This is called walk-forward validation. So this is our view so far of sequential data. 
Sequences in general consist of numbers, vectors, or symbols. And a dataset consists either of a single sequence per instance, as in the email example, or as a single sequence containing instances, as in the Sunspot example. Both of these can be converted to fit classic machine learning settings through feature extraction, but we can gain a lot by developing models that consume sequences directly without the need for feature extraction. And in the rest of the lecture, we will focus primarily on one-dimensional symbolic sequences and the extension to higher dimensionalities and numeric sequences is often a trivial one. And the first native sequence model that we'll look at is the Markov model. This is a probabilistic way of modeling sequences. It's very similar in its approach to naive Bayes. And the fundamental principle that it's built on is to estimate probabilities of small sequences from the relative frequencies in the data. But let's start at the beginning. The fundamental idea is that we want to model somehow the probability of seeing a particular sequence. For instance, the sentence, congratulations, you have won a prize. The first thing we do when we model probability is that we break up the sequence into its tokens. In this case, we will model this sequence at word level. So we break the sequence up into its words and we model each of the words in the sequence as a separate random variable. Note that these random variables are decidedly not independent. If word five is an article like A, then you're much more likely to see a noun like prize following it than another article like A or the. So this view leaves us with a joint distribution over six variables, which we would somehow like to model and fit to a data set. So how do we use our data set to estimate the probability that we will see this particular sentence? A naive way of doing this, and a trick we've used in the past, is to estimate probabilities based on relative frequencies of occurrences in the data. What that would mean here is that we simply collect a large data set of natural language, we look at the number of times the phrase congratulations, you have won a prize occurs in the data, and we divide that by the total number of six word subsequences. This is called the relative frequency of our phrase in the data, and it gives us a good estimate of the probability of that phrase. The problem is that we'd need an extremely large amount of data for all sequences of interest to have been seen. And if our sequences get longer, like full emails instead of sentences, we'll have no chance of collecting a data set where every email we're interested in has been seen before. What we need to do is break our sentence up into subsequences, estimate their probability, and then combine the probabilities of the subsequences to give us the probability of the whole sentence. And to do that, we'll look back to a simple property of probability that we've used a number of times before. The fact that we can decompose a joint distribution into a marginal on one of the variables times the probability of the rest of the variables conditioned on the variable we marginalized. This gives us the chain rule of probability, not to be confused with the chain rule of calculus, with which it has nothing to do. The chain rule of probability allows us to break a joint distribution on many variables into a product of conditional distributions. Applying the rule we saw in the previous slide allows us to decompose this joint distribution into two factors, one with the random variable w1 in the conditional, and the other being the marginal distribution on W1. And the next step is to simply apply this rule again to the factor on the left. So we move W2 to the conditional, and we multiply by the marginal distribution on W2, conditioned on W1. We can apply the same thing again, moving W3 to the conditional, and multiplying by the marginal distribution on W3, conditioned on W1 and W2. And by repeated applications of this chain rule of probability, we've broken up our joint probability on the whole sentence into four factors, the probabilities of each of the words conditioned on the words that precede them. Note that we could have done this in any order, but with sequences like language, it makes a lot of sense to condition the probability of a word on the words that come before it. This tells us that if we build some kind of model that can estimate for us these kinds of probabilities, the probability of a word given the words that come before it, we can then chain these estimates together to give us a full conditional probability on a sentence. In other words, we can rewrite the probability of a sentence as the product of the probabilities of all the words in the sentence conditioned on all the words that came before it. This view solves part of our problem. If we can figure out how to estimate these probabilities, then we can chain them together to give the probability of a whole sentence. And as before, 
we prefer to deal with log probabilities rather than plain probabilities, which turns the product into a sum. And it's particularly important here because these probabilities of a particular word given the words before it can become very small values, can get very close to zero. So it's very likely that once we start multiplying them together, they will underflow to become zero, which we can avoid by working with their logarithm. So the next step is to figure out how to estimate these kinds of probabilities. A model that does so, we call a language model. Note that getting this exactly right is no easy task. For instance, if we look at the partial sentence, the man fell out of the, and we look at what kind of words might be used to complete it, for instance, these four, then a relatively simple language model should be able to tell us that cycling has the lowest probability because it doesn't fit grammatically. The other three words, window, aquarium, and pool, all fit the sentence grammatically, but they should still get different likelihoods. For this, we need a language model that actually understands what these words mean and has some understanding of the meaning of the sentence. For instance, you can fall out of a window and an aquarium, but it's more likely for a sentence to talk about somebody falling out of a window. And falling out of a pool, while grammatically correct, is usually physically impossible, unless the pool is built in an unusual way. Therefore, we would expect pool to have a lower probability than aquarium, but a higher probability than cycling. For now, we will limit our expectations of what language models can do and look at a very simple way of building one. We do so by assuming that the probability of a word conditioned on all the words before it is equal to the probability of that word conditioned on only the two words before it. This is called a Markov assumption. We simply assume that only the preceding two words contain any information about which word is going to come next. This is clearly not true, and we should think of this a bit like the naive Bayes assumption. We know that it's incorrect, but it still yields a very usable and efficient model. The number of words we retain in the conditional is called the order of the Markov model. What we see here is a Markov assumption for a second order Markov model. And with this assumption in hand, we can look at the probability of our sentence, use the chain rule to break it up, and use the Markov assumption to limit the conditionals only to the previous two words. And the factors of this decomposition are always the probability of a word conditioned on at most the two words preceding it. And these probabilities we can reasonably hope to estimate from a sizable data set, simply by counting relative frequencies. For instance, the probability of seeing the word prize following the words 1 and A, we can estimate simply as the number of times we see in our data the phrase 1 a prize, divided by the number of times we see the phrase 1A. Doing so allows us to build a second order Markov model, because we're looking at the two preceding words, and all we have to do is count the frequencies of all three-word phrases and all two-word phrases. And these are called trigrams and bigrams, respectively. This type of language model is often called a Markov model because of the Markov assumption of limited memory. The size of the memory is referred to as the order of the Markov model. And the higher the order of your model, the more you can model, but the more data you'll need to make sure that you've seen all the engrams you're interested in often enough. With the kind of data set you can download and run yourself, you can estimate good statistics for bigrams and trigrams. If you have a larger corpus, like Google's Books corpus, you can easily estimate good probabilities of 5 grams. So, now that we have a way of probabilistically modeling sequences, what can we do? We'll use this to tackle both the case where our data consists of a separate sequence per instance, like in our spam classification example, and the case where our data consists of a single sequence and we're trying to predict the next token. First up, sequence classification. In that setting, this is the probability that we're interested in modeling. The probability that our instance is spam, given that its content is, congratulations, you have won a prize. We'll build a simple Bayes or generative classifier. So the first thing we do is use Bayes rule to reverse the conditional. The probability of the email being spam, given the contents of its message, is proportional to the probability of seeing the content of its message, given that it's spam, multiplied by the marginal probability of seeing a spam email. The marginal probability we can estimate as the proportion of spam emails in our dataset, as we've done before, 
And for the probability of the message given the class, we'll use our language model. We do exactly what we did before, except that all of our probabilities are now conditioned on the class spam. So we break up, as before, the phrase, congratulations, you have won a prize, into these six factors, where we condition the probability of each word on both the preceding two words and the probability that we're looking at a spam message. And that means that to work out the joint probability at the top, we need to estimate these conditional probabilities. Same as before, except now conditioned on the fact that we're looking at a spam email message. And the way to estimate this is very simple. We count the trigrams and the bigrams as before, but this time we count them only for the parts of our data that are labeled spam. This gives us an estimate of seeing the words 1a followed by the word prize, given that the email is spam, and a similar estimate for seeing the word prize following the words 1a, given that the email is ham. And putting all this together, we can compute a ham probability and a spam probability for every email we encounter. Here is the complete algorithm for a classifier using a second order Markov model. First, we split our data by class, and we will train a separate language model for each class. Then, in each of these subsets, we count all occurrences of unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams, and we store them in some data structure that allows us to quickly look up the frequencies. And this is all the training that we do. Then, when it comes time to classify a new sequence, we need to compute the probability of the class given that this is the content of the sequence, and we need to do that for every class. We start by reversing the conditional using Bayes' rule. We estimate the marginal probability of the class from the data, and to compute the conditional probability of the content of the sequence given the class, we apply the chain rule, which gives us a sequence of probabilities that we need to estimate, and we compute these estimates using the bigram and trigram frequencies that we saw in the data. Note that for the first two factors, there are not two preceding words. So to estimate these frequencies, we also need to count the unigrams. In practice, as we noted before, we tend to use log probabilities and to sum them to keep low probability values from underflowing. We can also use Markov modeling on unlabeled data to predict the future. In this case, all we need is simply a large amount of natural language text with no labels. Doing this on symbolic data is often referred to as sequential sampling, and it works as follows. We start with a seed, a small sequence of natural language, and we compute the probability of a particular word following this sequence. Using the Markov assumption, we allow ourselves to look only at the last two words, and using relative frequencies, we can compute this probability distribution from our data. So this gives us a probability distribution over all the words in our vocabulary. For most of these, the probability will be very low, but for some of them, like a, down, up, or with, these are natural ways of continuing this sentence, so these will get higher probability. And if we sample from this probability distribution, we are likely to get one of the words with high probability, in this case, down. We add this word to our sequence, which gives us a sequence of four words, I was walking down. And then we loop back to the beginning and repeat the whole process. Here's what that looks like written out as an algorithm. We start with a seed sequence of some tokens. We sample the next word according to our conditional probability. And we append the sampled word to the seed sequence and repeat. Note that with the Markov assumption, we only need the last n elements of the sequence to work out the probabilities. This kind of sequential sampling is also known as autoregressive sampling. And in the context of Markov models, the sampling process is often called a Markov chain. Here's a bit of text sampled from a Markov model trained on the works of Shakespeare. Even with such a simple language model, we can see some quite realistic patterns appearing. Some final comments on Markov modeling. If we build a zero order Markov model, where the probability of a particular word is not conditioned at all on any of the words coming before it, we recover essentially the naive base classifier. And for spam classification, higher orders don't tend to improve performance, and the zero-order Markov model does as well as you're likely to do. But for other tasks, higher-order Markov models may lead to better performance. If you want to use this kind of model in practice, you should account for the fact that under this model, 
short documents are vastly more likely than long ones. This doesn't matter for classification because we're always comparing the probability of a sequence of the same length under different classes. But in other settings, conditioning on the length of the document may be necessary. And finally, as before, we have to deal with the situation where a particular n-gram doesn't occur in our training data, but it does occur in our test data. The simplest way to do this is Laplace smoothing, which simply involves tweaking our estimators to add pseudo-observations. As before, we usually give the pseudo-observations a smaller weight than one, so that they have less impact on the final estimate. Sequential sampling of Markov models can lead to amusing results, but it's unlikely to fool a human reader for very long. However, if we let go of the Markov assumption and train a more powerful language model, the results will also become more realistic. For that, we need deep learning. In the remainder of the lecture, we'll look at ways of dealing with sequences in deep learning settings.